In early September, the Burnley Empire Theatre Trust held a series of open days to show the restoration work done inside the old theatre. Morning. Morning. Morning, Mr. Morning. Mayor. After Burnley's Mayor, Councillor Arif Khan, had donned hard hat and high vis, the first groups were invited in. And to tell us all about the progress made was Burnley Theatre Trust's Sophie Gibson. So here we are, and feel free to take any photos as well, you know, whilst I'm here. So I think the first comment was, wow, it's big. I don't think you realise how big it is until you stood there. And I've seen Richard stood near the stage, and that stage goes up another two Richards sort of thing. It, it's humongous. Um, so we're here in Burnley Empire, built in 1894, purpose-built music hall of varieties. It was built for the people of Burnley, so they could experience a variety of world-class entertainment. Because at the time there were other different theatres, venues, but there wasn't a variety of music hall. So it was uh, William Charles Horner, who was a lifelong member of Burnley Mechanics, he was the operating manager of the Victoria next door and he said we need this venue. So he championed for the Burnley Empire to be built at the time. It was a disused mill this site and part of the walls are made up from the original factory. And so he championed for that, yep. What, what was the Victoria? So that was right next door? Next door. So the Victoria Opera House, which you can imagine it had the ballets and opera. No, but didn't have Variety, no, not the no. music hall variety stuff. No. Didn't you have the working class? No, so so that's what he really championed and you know, same as today, you know, we say Bur Burnley needs this venue, a big large capacity venue for people to stop by off and experience all of this different type of entertainment that just doesn't come here because it's not the size. So that was one of the reasons why we were champion for it to be restored, but also just the fact of the building, you know, you've got all this architectural importance. Um, when it was built in 1894, it was then dubbed the prettiest theatre in the north. But as time moved on and other places were sort of getting more up to speed, they decided to redesign it in 1911. It was Bertie Crew that redesigned it. It was quite dramatic what he did. He changed uh, the circle which impacted the seating capacity. At one point, I believe it was around 2,000 the capacity of the Empire, but it decreased when he altered the stage. Um, sorry, the circle. Because his thing, you know, it was decorative plasterwork, all of this that he embedded and added onto the Burnley Empire to just make it that much more special, the real wow factor. So the Burnley Empire, it was listed in 1996, I believe and that was mainly for its decorative features by Bertie Crew. So it's a Grade 2 listed building and principal listed because of the decorative plaster. At one point, Lancashire had about 20 different large capacity venues, historic venues. It's just the one that remains, which is this one that was stood in the Burnley Empire. And out of the whole of the country, the Burnley Empire gets a lot of national interest because it's one of very few left actually designed by Bertie Crew. It was quite significant that he did work on the Burnley Empire and that we have this that still remains today. So there's a lot of people that study the Empire. We've worked with students from the Manchester School of Architecture. We've had two year groups visit. So graduates spent a full year studying the building, thinking of ways of how it could be used to serve the community, what they could do with it, how they could transform it. And then they graduated, and then we had another bout of students that came back in as well and did some more thinking about the empire and how it could be used. So, you know, we bought the building, we opened the doors, um, you know, we realised it needed some work. Uh, and then, you know, the main thing for us was to just block it up, make it safe, and start to build the information as well, which is where Richard comes in, I suppose. And we, we bought the building on the 5th of December, 2018, we had the support of National Trust to then apply for a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant uh, and that was a resilience grant and that was to make us resilient as a bunch of people from the community that bought this venue without going inside it but also the building and building up information about the venue as well. So we commissioned, I think it was a structural uh, survey as well as building condition survey. Yeah, it was a full structural condition survey 
and there was some cost planning associated with that to sort of inform these grants and repairs. I think coming in today, it's quite an interesting sort of snapshot of a much bigger story. When the building was first purchased, I think when someone came in they said, I'm surprised it was standing on stone. Well it wasn't, there was a full timber raked floor through here and one of the main challenges was it was contaminated with asbestos. Uh, when it was a bingo hall, there was an asbestos screen installed over the circle. And as kids had got in, they'd thrown chairs and things through that screen. But the debris had fell down and contaminated all through the ground floor. So there's been at least two or three rounds of asbestos clearance works. And what you can just see with the netting above you, the scaffolding, there's been an awful lot of work to get to this point, which for a lot of people probably looks like the starting point. Of, and it is. It's, it's a process that's ongoing, um, but I think it's don't underestimate all the effort that the team have gone to to get to this point now, because it's it's considerable. I'm sure when I first come in and first saw the building, I, it was tentative to what could be done, but what you've achieved is, is amazing. Even um, asbestos, when we had Graham all come to court up, was he quoting up for the demolition or, you know, actually taking the series as a project that, you know, the building could come back to life and even when he's come back and visited, he's had some really nice things to say, you know, it just needs, like, ambition and tenacity to keep going, that kind of stuff, which is... Cash. Yeah, <laughs> and cash, definitely cash. I think, you know, what we've done so far, and any money to us, it, it's massive, you know, anything that anyone can give to us. So talked about you know first stages when we met Richard and we started to build up information about the building that would inform our next steps that was the plan so we were going to sort of after 2019-20 be applying for like your typical grant funders that was the plan but unfortunately everything went a little bit sideways with the pandemic and you know the venues that were live and kicking there were the priority which is fair enough so you know, we couldn't follow the plan of going for the grant funds that were once available to us because they were no longer available. And that's when we turned to the general public with a crowdfunder campaign online and asked if people could help us because we needed to get into the building and clear up all of this stuff. I think I took this photo, or I'm in the photo, collecting all any decorative plaster work before um, the ground floor strip out happened. In this work it was done in about probably two weeks time and it finished the day before, the day before Christmas Eve. They sort of got it done pretty quickly but it was the fundraising in September that we did that enabled this massive clear up to happen that was the big enabler to be able to actually get into the building with a spider, get up and tackle the asbestos on the circle, the upper circle that we, you know, we benefited with funds from the Heritage Action Zone that helped us, that was major, and then we continued with more grant funds from um, the National <coughs> Heritage Fund, Architectural Heritage Fund, but really the enabler was to get this clear because no one was going to work in this. It wasn't safe for, for us to enter or people you know, like Richard to come in and actually do the work that we needed to do. So it was major that we were able to get so much support from the general public and that was about three years ago last week. So this was pretty much, you know, three years ago last week and this is where we are now. And there's a lot, as Richard says, that goes on behind the scenes. And if we're quiet online, it means that we're busy writing a grant application or something like that. But I genuinely believe that we are on the cusp of, of good things because we're at this position now where we're here and there's a lot more people that are interested. We've had the mayor in earlier and he was so, nice, kind and you know, warm to the idea as well as the leader of the council, which is huge for us because at one point we were just a group of people from the public that had never been in that wanted to save this building. Of course people would have thought we were crazy and you know, part of us would have been to do what we did, you know, we went on to buy the building um, with no experience either. You know, we I was at the time probably cleaning at the cinema and you know, I had my art career that kind of switched for volunteering on this, if I'm honest. And you know, you've got other people with different expertise that bring something to the table to keep it going. And we're all volunteers as well. So everyone that's been and gone has contributed something to get to this point, as well as everyone that's sort of here and still working. All that area of the stage house that faces down, um, and there's the idea 
of sort of taking a phased approach. So we've been taking a phased approach to stabilise the building, which means to target some of the most um, vulnerable areas where water and grass has sort of got into the building, target different parts of the roof and work downwards towards the stage. So we're sort of in a good place where we want to do some more uh, works in the central gutter. But as you can see, there's a beam of light shining on the stage there, so that means we've got a, a big window there that needs fixing, or a big hole in the roof. Is the roof completed now? Is that water tight and then finished? Parts of it. Parts of it. Parts of so it. the team prioritised the front here, and there was a, a big round of gutters with plaster. The stage area there is, as you can see, exposed masonry. There is timber that's assembled to rot, but it's not the decorative plaster that's in this side of the building. So this is the priority, and then as the funds allow, it'll go that way. But yeah, this side now is considerably drier than what it used to be, didn't it? Yeah, there, there was, you know, almost a waterfall, literally, right down there, right down the So that, I'd say, that was maybe two years ago that way, but it's during lockdown, and it, it's kept up its, you know, job. It's, it's not letting more water in there, as Richard said. You've got the important um, but, you know, there has been some benefit with that hole in the roof because over time it's allowed it to breathe and, you know, it's it's not, you know, we could have been in a totally different scenario with the decorative plasterwork, whether it would be here or not, if that was sealed, you know, yeah. it probably would have deteriorated. I'll be asked that, hopefully, still. Yeah. Um, How did the building but, yeah, to, it, fall into their hands in the first place? Um, it just, by default, I think whoever had had it, they'd lost it. So it just happened to go back to the portfolio. That? That What's that? Do we have a time for that when it happened to do? So when the Burnley Empire closed in 1995, that's when it got sold and it was that same person. So for us to have got it, I think they only had it for a few years. Um, so it might have been around 2000s, I believe. But, but you're right, that would have been... So the second door underneath the box, that would have been the entrance. It's like a corridor. You sort of yeah. came off the high street. But uh, does anyone know about the um, opera? I mentioned it. The uh, Victoria Opera House that was next door. So they were also connected at one point. So there was theatre here, and behind that wall, where the entrance is, they would have joined. So people could sort of stand in either theatre, the performances. Um, the acts, it's well known that they used to cross backstage and talk to one another. During the Blitz, um, when Sadler's Wells and Old Vic came up from London, they actually stored some of their sets in the Empire there whilst they were performing next door, and it was very easy access for them. So Sadler's Wells performed next door, but did they perform here? We're, we've not found that yet. I don't think, we're not sure. We're not sure. We've, we've not got that far. So there's a lot of us sort of recording and doing research and history, things like that. Um, but we've just not found, we've only just started to hit on that moment in time, really. We're only now really exploring the, um, the Vic Wells connection and what that meant for the Empire. So maybe they did. Um, we know that, but you know, it was crossing, it, it, it was operating at the same time. So, you know, practicing downtime, that kind of stuff. Could you tell us who famous people that, that performed here? Famous people that performed here? So... Apart from yourself. <laughs> so when we say that it was built for world-class entertainers, it really was built for world-class entertainers. So there was the likes of Chung Ling Su, um, who was a famous um, Chinese magician, although he was actually American. And he travelled around the world, but he travelled by train and he actually had all of his sets on the carriage. He had to have his own train, he had that much sort of gear. And he performed here at the Empire and he had 50 different backdrops. And his show was about three and a half hours long and he did two in one day for numerous days. What year were you talking here um, Early 19th century. Yeah, so 19 or, I'll check it for Early 20th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's, loads of people, Houdini, Houdini performed on stage um, and you know it's important for me to say that the Empire was always ahead of its time as well so it was the first place in Burnley to screen moving pictures and also it was discovered whilst we were doing our uh, crowdfunder online by a Houdini ex uh, 
for uh, Paul Zenon that people may know of. Um, it was discovered actually by an American, no, it was an American uh, Houdini expert that discovered that Burnley Empire screened one of his lost films. So they're still tracking this down. They, no one's managed to find it, but they're just discovering that it existed by the sort of newspapers and the listings that it, it happened here. So it's significant that Houdini performed here, but also that that lost film, that means that as soon as that was discovered three years ago, the whole world were updating the archives for Houdini. Because turns out this film that some people knew about, but not everyone, actually was screened at the Burnley Empire as well. Um, you've got, Mary Lloyd, Mary Loftus, lots of well-renowned, famous music hall singers performed here. Um, you know, in more recent days, there was the Rockin' Vickers, um, a band that lived on Paddyham Road, and you know, you might be able to tell me more about it. No, I can't say much about it, but I can remember. Well, apparently, so they they performed a song called Go Ape on stage that we've got the seven inch for, and, and they swung on stage from these balconies. They arrived on stage to the song Go Ape, and of course, um, we think Lemmy from Waterhead was playing guitar at that time in that band as well. And then not long after, I believe they went off to Blackpool, but they used to live on Paddy Road, top of Dugdale, I think, and drove around in a hearse. So they performed here. So you, you've got a few different people, and you know, it's just the weird and wonderful happened. And at one point, it sort of operated a lot more heavy <coughs> as a cinema, but the manager at the time, he was band manager, so he'd have some bands on before. And Sean, who's not here today, who's helped, you know, credit him for a lot of the research that's been done. He came across the story of um, the manager at the time being offended that someone wouldn't host a birthday party for his dog. So instead he hosted it in the Burnley Empire and there's a photo of like a picnic blanket laid on the floor with all these dogs, the dog and his friends and these bones on plates there. So all sorts of stuff happened inside the Burnley Empire. There's a, a huge amount of things. So, this, you know, this is where we're at. We've got to this point, and it's it's a long journey. We are on track from when we first started out in 2019, when we got the building, we were being practical. The time scale was looking like 2027, which we don't often say, but just sort of having a look and reminding ourselves, actually, we're in a good place because we're stabilising the building in preparation for restoration and reuse. So it's taken that much time to get here. That's right, it's normal, we're on track. Um, so the use of the building, we're thinking about multi-purpose, something that serves the community. After this tour, um, you will be sent a feedback form that asks for any ideas that you have, that, you know, what do you see coming in here to like see? What would you get a ticket for? What would you like to do? Spend the afternoon sat in here with a book, having a coffee somewhere in a coffee club, or, you know, what do you envision? We want to hear your ideas that can help because it's by the community, for the community very much and we get by from the support from people but of course we want people to use it and have a say on how it can be used as well, that's really important to us. So if you get that feedback form, well, please just spend a few minutes to make sure that you're doing that. Um, and plus it's helpful for us because it actually genuinely informs our grant application that me and Michelle work on and we're working on about four different streams of different works at the moment, very different, one including what we're going to do next year for the 130th anniversary of the Burnley Empire. So that's how old the building is and we want to do something special ne next year. That's something that we're thinking about. Who opened it just out of curiosity? Because I presume they had some functionary or celebrity or... Not really at the no? time. You I mean, think they were, they? The, one of the first acts to perform on there um, in 1894 was Cat Wheeler, so a man dressed as a cat on a bike, a cycle, doing all sorts of tricks. Uh, so it was very much sort of Victorian variety yeah. that was anything and everything and singers. Madame Paula, you told that story last time about Madame yeah. Paula yeah. and her tank that she had on the stage of yeah. reptiles in. Yeah, Madame Paula the reptile Crocodiles queen. Yeah, so she came from Paris to perform here. Um, her husband even donated some of her sort of um, acts to, I believe, the British, the National British Museum, maybe once she was done with them, I might not say that. But yeah, Madame Paula, she wrestled alligators on stage and did all sorts of stuff. And, you know, it's just, it, it's just everything. And that's what we want to do now. You know, if it's not happening in Burnley, it's because there's not the space for it. So we want to make sure there's the space for it. And, you know, what people want to do, they can do. So. 
it may be pop-up installation of something that you'd have to go to London to see or it might be a record fair or a Northern Soul Night but it also might be like your favourite band that doesn't come to them because it's not big enough, it's not worth the time. Um, it's not viable to restore it as a traditional theatre but we want to make sure that we're restoring you know, 21st century variety so performances can still happen on there, it just won't be its core thing because it's not viable unfortunately, not for now. Not viable? Do you mean just wouldn't work. Structure and thing, or, um, or financial. in financially. You mean financially? Yeah, yeah, financially. And as we're walking out, um, talk about the acts, we've got some sort of imagery from our archive, and there's the Java brothers um, who came over from Japan. It was Azuko who came over from Japan, settled in Burnley. They travelled around the world. They played everywhere, but they loved Burnley. So that's why we use a lot of their imagery. And, you know, we've got a big archive of everything that they kept. They loved Burnley towards the end, I believe. One of them was volunteering in a car park as well. Um, and I feel that we, we might be running out of time. Is it, what time is it, Michelle? Um, yeah. Is it time? That's it. That's it. So, yeah, yeah. so, so thank you everyone for thank coming you today. For, uh,